My name is Lisa All, and I'm the manager of audience programs at Pittsburgh Valley Theater. And my colleague is here with us tonight, Katie Giggler, who is the director of education. And Katie will be monitoring the chat and assisting with technical things and things like that. Um, but I uh, just want to thank you again for being here and to, um, uh, to kind of help us prepare for our Fireside Nutcracker performance tomorrow night, our premiere. We're so excited about it, our first ever virtual performance and virtual Nutcracker. And um, just really glad that you all are going to be watching hopefully tomorrow night and are here tonight. So what we're going to do tonight is do a quick journey through Nutcracker history. And we'll talk about kind of where the ballet came from and Pittsburgh Ballet Theater's um, experience with the Nutcracker. And we'll go into a little bit of pre preparing for the Fireside Nutcracker as well. So let's get started with, um, I'm gonna share my screen here. And, okay. So I thought what we would do first though, is do kind of a um, 60 second version of the story, just so that we're all on the same page for any of you who may not have seen the Nutcracker before or who hasn't, haven't seen it in a couple of years. Certainly none of us have seen it probably since last year. So just kind of a refresher on the story. So our story is about Marie and many of our other Nutcracker productions um, use the name Clara for the main character. And we'll talk about why that is in a little bit. But in our version, the main character is Marie and she's a young woman growing up uh, in a household uh, in Pittsburgh in our version and her family is having a Christmas Eve party. Also at the party that night is her godfather, Drosselmeyer, and he brings her a gift of a Nutcracker doll. Also at the party is the godfather's nephew, and the nephew has been cursed by the Mouse King, and he has this um, frightening appearance, and he scares people who are coming to the party. During the party, Marie's little brother, Fritz, breaks the Nutcracker doll, and the nephew helps her fix it. And Marie, of course, sees through his affliction and sees into his good soul. After everyone goes to bed, Marie runs back downstairs to find the Nutcracker doll and she sees that the house is changing. Everything is growing in the house and um, the tree, the furniture, and even her Nutcracker doll has turned into um, a Nutcracker being. <laughs> the house is full of mice and rats and they have grown to a larger size as well. And the Nutcracker engages in a battle with the mice and the rats and the mouse king. Marie helps the Nutcracker to defeat the Mouse King and they journey into the land of the sweets. And the land of the sweets is ruled by the Sugar Plum Fairy. And in the land of the sweets, other folks from different countries and lands dance for Marie and the Nutcracker. Well, the nephew at this point. <laughs> And at the very end of the ballet, Marie wonders if it was all a dream. She's back into her home and she's wondering if um, what she experienced during the evening was real. So those of us who love the Nutcracker and those of us who've seen it a lot of times, we really kind of just accept this story, but it's really kind of an odd and interesting story. And it comes from um, E.T.A. Hoffman, an author in the early part of the 19th century. The Nutcracker was actually written in 1816. 
But E.T.A. Hoffman was a major author of the Romantic movement. He was a writer, um, an arts critic, even a composer. And his favorite genre, genre was fantasy and Gothic horror, short stories and novels. And his stories were very um, uh, macabre, um, suggestive of the supernatural. And they really anticipated the surrealist literature of the 20th century and form somewhat of a cornerstone of the modern horror and fantasy genre. That's kind of funny um, to have uh, this author of our beloved and sweet <laughs> Nutcracker be really this um, pretty well-known um, horror writer. A selection of his stories were turned into an opera, The Tales of Hoffman. His, um, his writing was very poetic and very lyrical and really lent itself to opera and dance. And then another couple of his stories were turned into another ballet, Coppelia, in 1870. His short stories, The Sandman and the Doll, were kind of combined and turned into this um, kind of sweet story of Coppelia. But again, this story is about a mechanical doll that comes to life. His, um, another story that was turned into a ballet, of course, is The Nutcracker and the Mouse King, yet another story about a mechanical doll coming to life. And this is a story about a girl, as we saw at Christmas time, um, kind of a, um, on the surface, a sweet story, but in actuality, somewhat of a nightmare and a little bit scary and somewhat gory. And at the time was written as a, as a fantasy story for children, but also um, uh, one that you wouldn't expect to be um, considered a fairy tale at the time. Definitely frightening, definitely a little bit on the gory side. Um, and as we saw, um, Marie's strange godfather shows up for Christmas and his name is Drosselmeyer and translated loosely, it means one who stirs things up. And he really did do that in the story. Um, he brings these amazing toys that he has made and with them, he ignites Marie's imagination. And one of the toys, the Nutcracker comes to life and battles with the mice as we saw and the, the mouse king and Marie is taken away to this magical land of the dolls. There's a very complicated backstory about how the Nutcracker was cursed to be a Nutcracker, originally um, a prince. Um, and uh, just a little detour here about um, Hoffman's use of the Nutcracker. Um, nutcrackers were really pretty common in households at the time in Germany. Um, nuts were a wonderful and popular treat around the holidays. And so many, many households had nutcrackers. And so it wouldn't have been unusual for a child to receive a nutcracker as a gift at the time, even though now we kind of think that might be a little bit strange. Um, but so in the story, Marie keeps trying to tell her parents about the experiences that she's having uh, with this nutcracker that's come to life and the battle with the mice and all of that. And they keep telling her that she mustn't speak about her dreams and mustn't speak about her imaginings. And so he gives us the name for the family um, Stalbum, which means steel tree, translated as steel tree, kind of meaning this, um, this hold that they have on her, this control that they have over her, um, not wanting her to kind of um, follow her imagination and, and um, kind of find out who she is. So at the very end of the story, she leaves her home to go with the Nutcracker and to become the queen of the land of the dolls. And this was really kind of radical for Hoffman at the time and for the, um, the society at the time. Um, it would not have been usual to encourage a young girl to go off and to defy her family and to uh, go with someone to a different land and take up residence there. So we have with Hoffman and the original Nutcracker and Mouse King story really kind of um, a feminist story here, encouraging young girls, young women to 
go out and, and um, be who they can be. So with that in mind, what happens later on in that century um, after Hoffman has died, Alexander Dumas takes the story of the Nutcracker and the Mouse King and he softens it a lot. He takes out um, any reference to um, uh, anything frightening and scary. He takes out all of the um, kind of uh, intimations about Marie and makes it more of a children's fairy tale in the traditional sense. And then fast forward again to later on in the century at the Imperial Theater in St. Petersburg, Russia. So this is the Mariinsky Theater. And um, this is a theater for the pleasure of the czar, for the, the public as well, but primarily to um, a theater to entertain the czar. And here they would put on ballets and operas and other theatrical and musical productions. And at the time, it's about 1891 at this time. And at that time, the director of the Imperial Theater is a guy named Ivan Zivolovsky. And he is under a lot of pressure to come up with all of these productions to entertain the czar and the family. And um, he had the idea to transform the Dumas version of the Nutcracker and the Mouse King and this kind of Dumas lighter fairy tale version into a ballet. He thought that would work really well. And he tasks Marius Petipa, who is the ballet master at the Imperial Theater and was the ballet master there for decades, arrived there in the 1860s, I think, at some point. Um, so had a lot of experience, a lot under his belt. Um, so he tasks Marius Petipa with creating this ballet, The Nutcracker and the Mouse King. And Petipa, just as an aside, is who we consider to be the father of classical ballet. So he is the one responsible for, for all the great classical ballets of the era. The Nutcracker, of course, um, Swan Lake, The Sleeping Beauty. He really codified and kind of set down what classical ballet is. And it's a technique that we still use today. So Zivolowski also calls upon Tchaikovsky, Peter Ilyich Tchaikovsky, to compose the music. And Tchaikovsky was already famous at this time, a famous mus musician in Russia, composer. And Tchaikovsky and Petipa were already kind of a dream team, having created in 1890 the ballet, The Sleeping Beauty. Again, at the behest of Zivolovsky, who thought The Sleeping Beauty would be a wonderful story to turn into a ballet, and it was. It was hugely popular, a huge success with the czar and with the audiences, a major artistic success all around. And Zivolovsky wanted to and felt pressure to repeat that experience. This is another Sleeping Beauty image. And so what's happening in ballet at this time um, and what's ha what happened with the Sleeping Beauty is that it came to represent the very highest expression of classical ballet, the very purest expression of the technique and um, the artistry and uh, contained a cohesive storyline, contained all of the character dances that, that people were clamoring for at the time and divertissement and of course the beauty of classical ballet as well. And so we're at a place with Sleeping Beauty and in 1891 where the expectations for ballet coming out of the Mariinsky Theater are incredibly high. And so Petipa and Tchaikovsky got to work. And the way they worked was really kind of interesting. So Petipa would give Tchaikovsky incredibly specific instructions. And so Tchaikovsky is this, you know, very well known, very famous composer. And Petipa is, is feeding him. Um, all of this information about what he wants to see in the music down to the number of bars, down to how it should sound. And um, interestingly enough, Tchaikovsky was fine with that. He was um, not, you know, not disturbed by that at all. And this is the way they worked in The Sleeping Beauty as well. Um, 
so Zee Velosky wrote the scenario from the Dumas book, as we had mentioned. Uh, Pedipa laid out the scheme and gave Tchaikovsky those incredibly detailed instructions. And Tchaikovsky wrote much of the first act in under a month in early spring of 1891. But soon trouble kind of raised <laughs> its head and Tchaikovsky started to become pretty disillusioned with the story. He was felt it was deeply limited. He was very unhappy with uh, feeling those limitations in his composing and unhappy with what he was producing as well. He felt it was infinitely poorer than The Sleeping Beauty, which he had composed just a couple years prior. And then on top of that, his sister, with whom he had lived off and on and whom he loved dearly, his sister died and he was plunged into this state of grief and depression and mourning and found it incredibly difficult to work. So Zivolowski gave him an extension. They had hoped that the Nutcracker would open in, the, in December of 1891, but they actually extended into the following year because of Tchaikovsky's state of mind at the time. And then some months later, um, Petipa's 15-year-old daughter died. And he um, also just uh, fell into this incredible despair and also developed a debilitating illness. And so he has to pull out of the project and he turned the choreography over to his assistant, Lev Ivanov. And Ivanov um, took on the project uh, with gusto, but was possibly not as consistent as Petipa was in terms of churning out choreography that uh, was considered classical, that Zivolowski appreciated, that the czar would appreciate, um, and also was possibly um, uh, not talented enough in some people's eyes. So the Nutcracker finally premieres in December of 1892, and the reviews were not good. Um, a number of critics criticized the number of children in the ballet, even though the ballet was meant for children, <laughs> but they thought there were too many children and too much focus on the children, not enough classical dancing. It also shared the bill with an opera, Violante, which Tchaikovsky also wrote. And the opera was centered around uh, a young princess who went blind and who then was also cured. But this very serious opera was then followed by what was considered to be too light of a ballet. In addition, a lot of people complained that because the ballet was later than the opera, they had to wait till after midnight to see the best part of the dancing, the Sugar Plum Fairy, the Sugar Plum Fairy Pas de Deux. They thought the battle scene was chaotic and the music was too pulsating. This critic says that in the battle scene, you couldn't understand anything. There was disorderly pushing around from corner to corner. Another critic said that the ballet didn't even comply with any of the demands made of ballet. Um, there's nothing classical about this ballet. The scene that did get praise was the snow scene. And interestingly enough, that was uh, Ivanov's um, kind of his forte. He would later go on to choreograph the swans, the, the white act for Swan Lake. And so we do see even our strength coming through here in the snow scene. So the one thing that was not criticized <laughs> was the music. The music was universally praised and lauded for its remarkable orchestration and its revolutionary sound at the time. Um, I think that we hear it so often, we hear it so much during this season, especially we kind of, we can almost forget that it really is um, um, kind of a miracle of music. And unfortunately still Tchaikovsky considered it 
hugely inferior to pretty much anything he'd ever done. And he died less than a year after the Nutcracker premiere, thinking that the Nutcracker was a failure. Just a quick note that one, just one of the, the innovations that Tchaikovsky brought about because of the Nutcracker was the use of the celesta, which was a, a new instrument at the time. And he actually secreted it from Paris to Russia so that nobody else would see it or be able to use it before he was able to premiere it in the Nutcracker Ballet. Um, Pedipa had given him instructions for the Sugar Plum Fairy dance, and he wanted the Sugar Plum Fairy music to sound like drops of water shooting from a fountain. And I think Tchaikovsky um, really achieved that with the use of the celesta. Just want to give a shout out to, to um, Yolan Collin, who is PBT's um, principal pianist and music administrator. He did a program a couple of weeks ago about the music of the ballet and that's now up on YouTube and will be available shortly. And hopefully um, you can take a look at that too because it's a lot of wonderful information about the score and the music of the ballet. So with the failure of the Nutcracker in 1892, how did it become kind of the ubiquitous um, ballet that is across the world today and across the United States? Well, it fell out of the repertory basically in Russia after the, the, the premiere in 1892. It was, it was performed for maybe 10 or so years and then was just out of the repertory. It reappeared at the Sadler's Wells Ballet, which would become the Royal Ballet in England in 1934. And then in 1940, the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo brought a portion of the ballet to America and started touring around America. And so that was the first taste that anyone in America had had on, on American soil of the Nutcracker Ballet. And again, that would have been a an audience that was somewhat privileged who would have been going to the ball a ballet Russe performance at the time. So certainly it was not seen by very many people during the 1940s. But the thing that was seen and heard in 1940 was Fantasia. And Fantasia, Disney's movie, uses music from the Nutcracker Suite. And Tchaikovsky had put together nine, eight or nine pieces from the Nutcracker into a suite and actually that was performed even before the Nutcracker Ballet premiered. And Disney's use of that in Fantasia really got Americans' ears accustomed to this Nutcracker music. And so by 1944, we see the first homegrown production in the United States with San Francisco Ballet. William Christensen, the artistic director there at the time, created his own production of The Nutcracker. But what really got the ball rolling with Nutcracker popularity in the United States was George Balanchine's version in 1954. George Balanchine was the artistic director of New York City Ballet and the most, probably the most important choreographer of the 20th century. And Balanchine actually performed in the Russian, the original Russian version of the ballet when he was a young student at the Mariinsky Imperial Theater School. So he played a number of different roles, including the Nutcracker slash nephew. So he had a lot of experience with the ballet and a lot of love for the ballet. And he, um, his production followed as closely as possible his own memories of the ballet in Russia. And what I love about this scene, this is a, a recent picture of Balanchine's production of the Nutcracker, the snow scene. So you see his, his uh, vision of the snow scene and then the original Ivanov 
vision of the snow scene. So I think it's really wonderful that those look so similar, really, you know, balancing, pulling from his memories and from his heart to create his own version of the Nutcracker. But it's really Balanchine's version that, um, that really gets Americans um, familiar with the Nutcracker and starts this kind of um, uh, rollerball effect that we have had over the last 50 or 60 years with, with Nutcracker becoming so incredibly popular and so incredibly important to ballet companies around the country. There are many, many versions of the Nutcracker at this point. On the right here, you see Washington Ballet's version with kind of a patriotic theme. And on the left is just one of many um, interesting takes on the Nutcracker, the hip hop Nutcracker, which I think came to Pittsburgh even pretty, maybe even last year, pretty recently tours around um, the country. And so today, Nutcracker productions are really the lifeblood of so many ballet companies and mean so much financially to, uh, to most ballet companies, most professional ballet companies. So I thought we would just talk a little bit about the different versions that Pittsburgh Ballet Theater has performed of the Nutcracker. In the 1970s, our, when we, we were created, a Pittsburgh Valley Theater was formed in 1969, and through the 1970s, we performed a version created by Nicholas Petrov, who was our first artistic director. And then in the 1980s, our artistic director, Patricia Wilde, was a protege of George Balanchine. And so we were able to use Balanchine's version of the Nutcracker during her tenure here. That's another shot. That's a shot of the rehearsal of the Russian dance, the, of the Balanchine version with Pittsburgh Ballet Theater dancers. And then in the 2000s with our artistic director, Terrence Orr coming on board, Terry, decided to create his own version of the Nutcracker. When he first came to Pittsburgh in 1997 and first took the job here, he said that he was immediately struck by the beautiful geography of the city, the drama of the city, and the unique vistas of the city. And he immediately started to kind of imagine this new Nutcracker. And he really dove into local history for inspiration. Um, kind of reimagining the story with a Pittsburgh base and a Pittsburgh theme and incorporating some of um, uh, our favorite Pittsburgh elements, the architecture. He also found um, a book called Kaufman's Christmas Stories for Boys and Girls, which was an actual book published in 1906 by Kaufman's department store, which was um, a huge and wonderful um, um, business here in Pittsburgh for almost a century. So in the early part of the 1900s, the Kaufmans produced this book that they would give to their best customers, this sto Christmas story book. And Terry um, found a copy of it and used it as inspiration for the battle scene in the Nutcracker. All of the all of Marie's toys and dolls come out of that book to help her and help the Nutcracker defeat the mice and the mouse king. Another Pittsburgh element that Terry included was a nod to the many, many wonderful amusement parks that dotted Pittsburgh, especially in the early part of the 20th century. There were a couple dozen of them. And he thought that this would be a wonderful way to express the land of the sweets by turning it into a land of enchantment. So you see our carousel characters here and the, the beautiful carousel that comes down from the, um, the ceiling of the theater, if you've ever seen it in, on the stage, it's a really great prop there. And just wanted to honor 
not only Kennywood, but this is a image, an image of Luna Park, which was up in the um, uh, kind of shady side area of Pittsburgh. You see a, a great carousel over there on the right. And then also he sprinkled the ballet with famous Pittsburghers, including this nod to Andrew Carnegie. The kilt that the dancer is wearing there was is the actual tartan of the Carnegie family. And uh, Terry and Janet, our costumier, were able to get special permission from the Carnegie Foundation to use that in the, as, in the costumes in the ballet. When we produced the Nutcracker in 2002, the costumes were by Zach Brown, a Broadway designer. And this was a huge challenge. There are 210 costumes and they represent everything from pretty authentic period dress to animal costumes and other fanciful ballet costumes. Most of the costumes were made here in Pittsburgh. Others were made in New York and Washington DC at specialty costume houses. So just segueing now into Fireside Nutcracker and our new production, again, kind of a reimagining of the ballet and fitting it into this new world and a new way of performing. So we filmed the Fireside Nutcracker in October in just one month. We had months of planning ahead of time to get this thing underway with uh, including planning for safety protocols on set. Since October, the film has been in editing. And so, um, so a month of filming and then two months of editing. We changed the location, of course. Um, we normally perform at the Bennett M. Center here in Pittsburgh. And for the film, we filmed Act Two at Point Park University in one of their theaters. And then Act One, the party scene, we were able to film at Hartwood Acres Mansion, which was a wonderful place to, to film Act Two. One Hartwood Acres Mansion is in Hartwood Acres Park up in the North Hills of Pittsburgh. It was built in the late 1920s, and so that makes it really um, a great location for the party scene since our party scene is set in the early 1900s and the Hartwood is built around that same era. So it's a really kind of authentic and um, uh, location for the party scene. It was built by Mary Flynn Lawrence, who was the daughter of William Flynn, who was a Pennsylvania state senator and also a, a construction mobile here in Allegheny County. William Flynn Highway, Route 8 is named for him. He actually retired in the early 1900s to Beechwood Farms, that was his original retirement home and later donated to the Audubon Society here in Allegheny County. But Mary Flynn Lawrence uses her inheritance from him upon his death to purchase the land that Hartwood Acres now sits on and to build that amazing home. She was a prominent suffragist actually, and she was the one who kind of fired an opening salvo at a suffrage convention here in Pittsburgh in 1912. And she also spoke for the suffrage movement at the Republican National Convention in Chicago at that same year. She became the vice president of Allegheny County elections and she was also secretary of the Commonwealth. So a pretty um, uh, an amazing woman who owned Hartwood Acres Mansion at first. Just a shot of the interior and a shot of some of the filming that we did in Hartwood. So the paneling in the house dates from the 1600s actually. Mary Flynn Lawrence had someone go to England and get some paneling from old um, manor houses there and brought it over here. 
The limestone on the house is from Indiana, Pennsylvania. She also loved riding and loved horses and often would have um, horse races out there. She built a wonderful stable out there as well. And in this shot, you can see that they've left a lot of her decor in the home as well. You can see that equestrian painting behind Diana there in the photo. So another difference with the fireside nutcracker is that the story has a narration. And we have not had this in the ballet before. Obviously, we have a synopsis that you can read in the playbill. But the film will actually be narrated. And this is a shot just of the filming of the narration. And the, the concept is that there is a grandfather who's telling the Nutcracker story to his granddaughter. This is obviously a shot of when the filming was taking place. And the, the narration was actually kind of screen written by Mariana Cherkasky, who is Terry Orr's wife and our, um, uh, one of our ballet repetitors. So we, you, of course, we used all the costumes that we made for the original Nutcracker, but um, we actually added a couple costumes as well because we added characters. So there is a new character in the snow scene called the Winter Fairy. And the shot here on the left is the Winter Fairy costume in the ballet Cinderella. And we did not use that actual costume, but Janet Campbell, our costumier, modeled a new costume for our new character, the Winter Fairy, on that costume. And then we used these costumes on the right for some additional new characters. There are two new lead flowers in the flower scene in Act Two. And because we didn't have any more flower costumes <laughs> um, for the Nutcracker, we, Janet kind of augmented these costumes with some additional um, um, beautiful petals, and uh, we reused two of these costumes for the new lead flowers in the ballet. We, of course, had um, masks on during the filming. Um, the children, the PBTS students were in masks the entire time, and many of the dancers were, professional dancers were as well. The dancers, since uh, we came back to the studio in late spring, the dancers were divided into pods. And so certain dancers did their class and rehearsals together. I think there were three different pods. And so those dancers all stayed together and the, the three pods don't never really mixed. The other thing that happened in the Fireside Nutcracker is that anytime there were two dancers dancing together, such as these two, the Sugar Plum Fairy and her Cavalier, um, the two dancers, dan if dancers were going to be dancing together and touching and dancing in close proximity, they had to be in the same household. And so it ends up that most of the dancers, most of the couples in the ballet are actually married couples or engaged couples so that they could dance. Wanted to hear just a little bit from the dancers themselves to talk about how the experience of filming went for them. And first wanna hear a little bit from Cooper Verona uh, and Joe Parr who were the, Cooper was the mouse king in the ballet and Joe portrayed the nephew slash nutcracker. So let's just hear how filming went for some, for the two of them, just a little clip here, let's see. It was really difficult, actually, more so than I thought it would be. Um, in the stage show, you put on the head a couple minutes before you come out, you go and the battle scene's not that long, and you take it off. It's not the most comfortable thing. It's very front heavy. It's on a bicycle helmet, and the front of it is weighing down. So it weighs on your neck, and you don't really realize that um, until you have to wear it for hours. 
Um, so that was the biggest challenge. And after every take, like after I would die, I would actually be dead and I'd have to like struggle to take everything off because I also was wearing a mask underneath the rat mask. So it was like an extra layer. I couldn't breathe. My neck was, um, kind of jacked up after that, but, um, yeah, that was the biggest difference uh, to me. I mean, it, the the choreography did change too. We did that walk around uh, Joe was talking about and the whole thing was reversed, but luckily we were smart enough to manage that. <laughs> <laughs> so definitely some challenges there for in that particular scene. The battle scene was filmed at Point Park University with some of those same props that you saw, the big book and a couple of other things, but, but lots of changes for the dancers too to be able to uh, work around, to have to work around. Let's hear now from Diana Yoey. And again, Joe Parr is in the, this clip too. Diana is portrays Marie and Joe portrays the nephew Nutcracker. That they look forward to every year. Um, for us, it's been very, uh, very different from, you know, the regular show. I mean, you kind of never in my entire time dancing did I think, wow, I have to look the same as I did yesterday. <laughs> or you're prepping to film and, and like even as something as silly as like making sure that your makeup looks the same. And, you know, actually, we don't necessarily film in chronological order. So there was a couple times where we had to go back and be like, oh, I was supposed to be wearing that scarf or oh, I was supposed to be wearing the crown in that scene. And so it's a lot of, um, you can't think sequentially. You have to mm -hmm. kind of go backwards and be like, okay, so this is the part of the story we're at. And this is where Marie is at within her character. Um, so she needs this, this, and this. So you kind of, it's, I guess we're getting an idea of what it's like to be an actor yeah, it is, it is kind of challenging because often like when we're performing that you can just kind of get lost in the role and like, I mean, not to harp on like being in the moment, but it really, it's really a big uh, aspect. So you kind of have to like try to try to channel uh, the emotions and try to like, okay, take three and then like <laughs> try to feel the, the exact same way you do when you've been like building up to that point. It's so, oops, sorry about that. <laughs> so let me just turn that off. Okay. So you can see lots of challenges, lots of new experiences for our dancers, for the entire company. Um, getting the Fireside Nutcracker together. And it strikes me that the Nutcracker has always, since 1892, has endured challenges and, um, and that this new version that we've created and this new kind of experience that we've had is just another one of those. Um, we are not the only Nutcracker, only virtual Nutcracker production out there. And so we're really, gratified that you all are going to be watching tomorrow night. We're grateful that you're going to be with us and just thank you all so much for, for joining us tonight and for watching tomorrow night. If you have any questions, we'd love to answer them. Um, you could also email us at education at and we'd be happy to answer your questions there too.